So I apologize in advance if, if some of this might seem redundant or repetitive. Um, but I think it's important to you know talk about this stuff historically so we can understand what's going on presently. Um, so I will explain a little bit about what Hanford was and is, and I'm going to do a, a little reading from the book, and then we'll do a Q and A and open it up for conversation and hopefully have a nice dialogue um, about your concerns, criticisms, questions, anything like that. Um, so Hanford was one of the three locations chosen for the Manhattan Project, along with Los Alamos and Oak Ridge. Uh, Hanford was chosen because of its remoteness. Um, and as you know, maybe the Hanford Project, I'm sorry, the Manhattan Project was used to develop atomic weapons for the US government covertly. Um, Hanford was chosen because it was remote. They had access to clean, fresh water on the Columbia River. And also, and perhaps most importantly, the to the government at the time, to the Manhattan Project, uh, the people on the land were expendable. Um, the indigenous communities were easily removed. Uh, the farmers that were on the land were easily removed. So there wasn't a lot of pushback from locals. Um, it, over the course of its life, Hanford produced majority of the plutonium that was used in the US arsenal of atomic weapons. It operated uh, until the late 80s, from the mid 40s to the late 80s, and kind of ceased operation at the end of the Cold War. Um, but during that legacy of weapons production and the plutonium production, there was an enormous amount of radioactive and high level waste that was left on site. There were billions of gallons of chemical waste that were quite literally dumped into the soil. And to give you a little perspective, you know, you know Eastern Washington, so you know that it's expansive. Uh, the Hanford, Hanford nuclear site is about 564 square miles, uh, which is, I think, I've heard of this, I haven't done the math, but I think it's about half the size of Rhode Island, uh, four times the size of Lake Tahoe. I mean, it's in a massive, sprawling uh, land. Now, not all of that land has um, parts of this weapons apparatus on it, but there are different sites on the land. And in the front of the book, you can see a little map of the Hanford Reservation. Um, for, for decades, it was really a covert operation, right? I mean, it was being used to produce plutonium. So a lot of the people that even worked at the facility at its inception when it was being built didn't even know what other people were doing on site. Uh, most of the people were living in Richland, the adjacent town that really was born out of the Manhattan Project. Um, but you might be living next to somebody and your neighbor worked at Hanford, but you didn't talk about what they did um, because everybody's jobs were pretty secretive and that was you know, intentional. Um, and it, it operated under that guise of secrecy for literally decades uh, until you know, even to this day, as, as uh, we can get into, I think that cloak of secrecy still exists in many ways. Um, so during its, its operation, as I mentioned, a lot of radioactive waste was, was produced. Um, and radioactive waste it can last hundreds of thousands of years, and in some cases, uh, millions of years. Um, the, the waste that is most concerning right now um, to, to me and to a, a lot of the environmental community and to scientists uh, is sitting in, in these huge underground tanks. There's 177 huge underground hulking tanks out at Hanford. Uh, most of those tanks are single shell tanks. They were only supposed to last you know, 20 years or so. We're now going on 80. Um, it's, it's an amazing uh, amount of radioactive waste. 50, I think it's 56 million gallons right now are sitting in these tanks, uh, which is kind of perplexing to kind of understand how much that really is. Um, and aside from the waste in all of these tanks, there are huge amounts of chemical waste and radioactive waste in the soils themselves. Um, and they've been tracking this stuff um, since, you know, since the operations began at Hanford. Uh, there's huge plumes of iodine-119, um, though that's leaching into groundwater supplies that will eventually make its way to the Columbia River. There's evidence that it has in the past. Uh, there's other chemical waste on site that's getting into the groundwater supply. And um, most disheartening to me, I think, right now is that we have two tanks that are currently leaking radioactive waste into the soil. Um, those, those leaks have been going on in one case. We've known about it since, I think, 2011 been leaking now for 12 years. They don't have an answer for it. Uh, they don't really know what to do. 
so they've now put these big tarps over them, hoping that that will stop rainwater from getting in there and pushing that radioactive waste further down into the soil. Um, the other tank we found out about leaking about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, and same thing with that. We don't really know what to do with it. And why is that? Well, the, the waste in these tanks is very complicated. Uh, every tank has a different sort of mixture or stew of waste. So it's not as easy as just taking this stuff out, turning it into glass, which, which has been the big plan since the 80s to vitrify it. Um, and so they, they take this stuff out and they don't really have another place to put it. Um, so there's talk of building new tanks to put this stuff in so that the leaky tanks, but there's a layer of bureaucracy at Hanford that perpetuates every aspect of the cleanup. Um, and as I, as I write about in the book, I had a couple whistleblowers talk to me about how they see this. Um, we often hear the Department of Energy and others talk about sort of a rosy proje projections that the money that's being spent out at Hanford, which by the way, is the most of any environmental cleanup in world history. Uh, the most recent uh, government accountability office price tag is $677 billion. Um, it was about 400 billion just a few years ago. It's exponentially going up. I think by the end of the decade, it would be a trillion dollars. Um, so the money being spent out there uh, really isn't getting the job done. Um, and I would argue it's really not about the amount of money that's being spent, as the whistleblowers told me. In particular, one of them, uh, Donald Alexander, was a high-level uh, scientist with the Department of Energy, warned me that you know the Department of Energy is very well intentioned. They are they're the ones in charge of the cleanup. Um, but they're understaffed. And the contractors out there, the ones making all of this money, uh, really run the show. They're the ones that have the power. They're the ones that have the expertise. They're the ones that have the money to spend on more technical staff. So it, it is not only the most expensive environmental cleanup uh, in world history, I would argue it's also the most complicated um, because there are so many different aspects of the cleanup, right? There are aspects of uh, contaminated groundwater, uh, in soil, we have these these tanks, which, by the way, um, is also uh, in many ways a ticking time bomb, um, which we can get into. I don't want to scare everybody, <laughs> scare everybody since we're in the shadows of this thing. Uh, but uh, two of these tanks, well, more than two of these tanks, produce hydrogen. Uh, the gases that build up in those tanks have to be released. If they're not released, and somehow there's an ignition, if there's a spark that ignites this hydrogen we could see uh, an explosion out there. Uh, it wouldn't be like a, a detonation of a bomb, but it would release radioactive materials across the country and definitely impact the local area and those downwind from that um, as well. Uh, and that was one of the big concerns that um, Donald Alexander talked to me about. Um, and it, this is not without precedent. There was a, an incident in uh, the former Soviet Union at a facility called Mayak. And Mayak, um, exploded, I believe, in 1957. Um, and it was a sister facility to Hanford. It also produced plutonium. And it was something that happened that no one really talked about because, like Hanford, it was a covert military operation. So even the locals there knew something was, was wrong. They knew that there was some kind of disaster, but they didn't know what had happened. Um, and it wasn't until much, much later that we started learning about the, the impacts of that explosion out at Mayak, which today is still a very contaminated area. And I think uh, most recently, it still is the third most uh, radioactive release, um, accident, accidental release in world history. But it's, a, it, it, but it's an incident that not a lot of people know about. Um, similarly, I don't think a lot of people know about Hanford. Um, and I, that's obviously, I believe, intentional. It was intentional because it was a weapons production site, but it's also intentional now, because I think there's a lot of profit incentive for these corporations not to invite scrutiny or um, make it open so that we can critique aspects of the cleanup, because we're, even though we're paying for it, taxpayers are paying for it. So you know, that's kind of where we're at today, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to um, do more research and write, write this book. Um, it's certainly not a book that uh, is going to give you all the answers. Um, because I don't think there are answers for some of this stuff. Um, but I think it's going to hopefully spark a little interest and awareness of, 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 you know, to the community outside of this region, but especially here, because this is you know, going to directly impact 
um, every one of you and all of us and all of those that are you know rely on the Columbia River. Um, you know, if, if there were to have a major accident out there, or if we don't put a stop to this groundwater contamination, you know, the Columbia River is going to be so impacted. We're going to have ten, tens of thousands of farmers that are impacted, commercial fisheries that are impacted, not to mention the economies of the Northwest, right? I mean, if the Columbia River goes down, um, this whole economy does in this whole region, which I think would, you know, uh, catapult a national emergency um, and probably go global. So. I think it's really important for so many reasons for, for this to be front and center. Um, you know, I often think about, we all remember probably the uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf, right? Where we had that 24 hour live cam footage and we could see the devastation of the oil like gushing out like Old Faithful, except it never stopped um, until much after the fact. And it was, I think all, everybody was concerned, rightfully so, that the, the Gulf was being polluted and we were, right, we were angry, right? We were angry that BP was responsible for this. And we learned that there was a lot of malfeasance and they, were, they, they had gone around a lot, of, you know, quite a few regulations to, and we had this horrific accident. Well, likewise, I think at Hanford, we should have that type of same type, type of scrutiny. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that 24 hour camera showing these leaky radioactive tanks. If we did, I think, you know, CNN might be covering that. Unfortunately, they're not. Um, fortunately, the New York Times did a piece uh, a couple weeks ago, which I recommend everybody after they read this to go check that out. <laughs> um, uh, but they did a very good job in talking about some of the, the lingering problems out there and some of the, the problems with the, the solutions. Um, right now, and this is a hangover from the Trump administration, uh, there is a push to declassify uh, some of the radioactive waste out there from high level to low level. Um, this isn't the first time that they've tried to do this out of Hanford. This has been going on since at least the 80s. Um, and in doing so, it will give them different options to do stuff with this radioactive waste. So if they declassify it, if they make it a low level waste, they don't have to worry about it quite as much. Um, but that creates a lot of problems. Uh, so since the 80s, they've, they've, I've mentioned vitrification, turning this waste into glass. They promised, you know, I went back and I read some of the press releases from these companies. And, and if you were to read them in 1990, you'd say, oh, this thing's going to be totally cleaned up and perfect by 1997. <laughs> well, <laughs> it didn't happen. Um, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, and the idea at that time was we're going to take this stuff out of these tanks. We're going to turn it into glass. We're going to store it safely, clean up the mess. It's all, it's going to be great. Well, that didn't happen. Um, fast forward to 2010, they said, we're going to get this waste treatment plant up and running, which is the vitrification plant, and we'll have this stuff vitrified in five years. Fast forward, 2015, the plant is not even built. Um, fast forward again, 2020, plant is not built. Contracts keep going up. The price tag keeps skyrocketing. No waste has been vitrified. In fact, last and, and right now the waste treatment plant isn't even being worked on because there's so many technical and, and structural problems. Uh, just this last fall in 2022, right about the time this book came out, uh, they had a test facility up and running that they had spent millions of dollars on that was supposed to do a test run of vitrification. It was almost like a, there was a ribbon, literally like a ribbon cutting. And whatever the news, news press was there, everybody was so excited about this thing. Turned on the, the vitrifier, and a week later, it overheated. Mm -hmm. So it, not, no, no vitrification took place. They were only going to vitrify low-level waste, you know, not even the bad stuff. Um, meanwhile, we're putting the bill, right? Um, and this has to do with the fact that these contracts that are out at Hanford, and some of the big uh, contractors out there are Bechtel, uh, URS, and a few other corporations. Um, and these contracts are literally written by Bechtel. They came up with this idea decades ago for something called cost plus contracts. Um, as you probably have ever done any kind of work on your home and you have a contract to come and they say, oh, it's going to be $10,000 to redo your kitchen. It ends up being $18,000 because materials went up, they encountered an electrical problem or a plumbing problem. Well, 
take that and multiply it by billions, and that's what's happening at Hanford. And these cost plus contracts enable these corporations to continue to profit, even though they're not getting the job done. And and that's a really really big problem. Um, and I think it's at the heart of why the cleanup hasn't moved along faster. Um, there are very uh, there's there's a lot of very well intentioned people out at Hanford. Um, people that I don't agree with politically, but we all have the same vision of a future where this site isn't as contaminated um, and is not a ticking time bomb. Um, and I don't, I don't know, you know, we call it a cleanup out at Hanford. I don't know if it ever can truly be clean. You know, I don't think it'll ever be truly safe, at least not in our lifetimes. Uh, plutonium, for example, that's lingering out there, uh, is radioactive for 240,000 years. Um, you know, to put that in perspective, humans have only been roaming outside of Africa for 60,000 years. So, um, you know, that's, <laughs> it's a long time and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, but the workers out there are really, I think, for the most part, very well intentioned, uh, working very hard in very, very dangerous conditions. Uh, some of the most dangerous jobs that we have. And I think that the management out there, for the most part, um, has the right goals in mind. But many of them are caught in this, this system that perpetuates profit over getting the job done. And um, with that, there is this cloak of secrecy that I believe um, really invades every part of this project, of the cleanup project. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit of the chapter from a whistleblower named Ed Bricker. Some of you who probably read the book, this will be a little uh, repeat. But um, I think he kind of encapsulates, his story encapsulates a time period at Hanford uh, that we wish didn't still exist. Um, it was a period when the, the site was still operating as a, as a secret site. Um, but I think a lot of the problems that he he encountered raising concerns about safety issues out at Hanford exist today. And so I, I, I think that his story is, is, a, is an important one um, because he is somebody that I probably wouldn't agree with politically, <laughs> but he's also somebody that I would really agree with about um, accountability and, and, and concern for the environment and concern for the workers out there. So I'm gonna read a little bit of that chapter and maybe the, we'll see how we go if my voice holds out and I'll read the whole thing. Um, and then we'll open up for a little Q&A and have a little discussion, which I hope uh, everybody will feel free to participate in. So if you have a book, feel free to follow along. Um, it's chapter five, uh, To Kill a Whistleblower. <clears throat> if you don't have a book, we have plenty of free books in the back. So <laughs> you know, please take those please with you. Grab them. Uh, it is on page 129. And uh, on the previous page on 128, you'll see a photo by an, uh, a photo artist, Mark Rudell, of the Hanford B reactor. Um, the B reactor was the first full scale plutonium reactor in the world. Um, and I did a tour of that reactor. Um, and something else. So let's start here. It's never been easy to be a whistleblower at Hanford, and certainly not in the late 1980s when the area was still operating inside a foggy cloud of government secrecy. As a third generation local and son of a Hanford worker, Ed Brick Bricker knew full well what sort of task he was undertaking when he was offered a job as a nuclear materials processor at his hometown site. Bricker, a well-built man with a bit of a bulldog grimace, believed that the work, much like his life in the community of Richland, was one of patriotic duty. A devout Mormon and a father of five, Bricker never imagined living anywhere else. Richland and Hanford were both home. Bricker remembers racing out to Hanford in September 1963 in the back of his father's 1959 Buick for the groundbreaking ceremony at the end reactor. President Kennedy flew in on a helicopter for the celebration just months before that fateful day in Dallas. I shook JFK's hand. I was about nine. It happened so quickly, Ricker recalled. 
In the late 70s, Ed Bricker and his high school sweetheart, Cindy, took jobs at Hanford upon graduation. It was the only game in town, and they were happy to have work as well as the money to support their young family. But all was not well at Hanford. And Bricker saw the blatant and egregious mismanagement firsthand. It was rampant, corner cutting that proved fatal. Early on in Bricker's tenure at Hanford, his childhood friend died in a crane accident after Bricker, following orders, did not connect the safety alarm that would have prevented his friend's death. The sad event changed the course of Bricker's life. Initially, Bricker was hired to work at Hanford's waste storage facilities, but quit to attend a local college. He was rehired at, after finishing his program, this time with more responsibility and a new job at the Z plant, a code name for the plutonium finishing plant. The Z plant was shut down in the 1970s, but resurrected in 1983 when President Reagan began to ramp up US weapons development. This place was designed for production first and safety second, said Bricker. Now it's cleanup first and safety second. Z was a mess and Bricker earned, quickly earned reputation for speaking his mind and confronting management about the avoidable mishaps he saw day in and day out. <clears throat> the plant was meant to produce plutonium buttons for bomb cord, but it wasn't fit to operate. I could see the problems clearly, said Bricker. It was horrifying. Z plant should never have started up when it did. Bricker's safety diligence soon got him elected steward for the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Weapons Union. That's when the trouble began. His complaints, many of them made directly to Jim Albaugh, the head of Rockwell Safety and Quality Assurance, piled up by the day. They included a report about a control room that had been left unattended, an instance where plutonium was handled in a room with unsealed windows, and even a plutonium being piped to the wrong location. These complaints were all but, but ignored, all ignored by his employer Rockwell, a contractor that operated under the guidance of the Department of Energy. Bricker didn't last long at Z and was transferred, and requested a transfer. His role with management wasn't getting any easier. The issues he raised were continually suppressed. Workers began to turn against him. He was labeled a crybaby by one dismissive boss. Workers called him a whiner. In 1984, Bricker finally left his post at Z and moved over to Hanford's tank farms. The new job didn't stop Bricker from pointing out various safety violations downplayed or outright ignored by Rockwell in the Department of Energy. He continued, even though fellow workers, many of many of whom once were once allies, were now teaming up with management to paint him as a villain. I was honestly concerned that the facilities were being mismanaged, said Bricker. I was sticking my neck out. I thought I was doing it for my country, getting this rogue agency reined in. He could have made a much bigger stink, but Bricker refrained from taking his concerns to the press. This didn't mean he was afraid to up the ante. By 1986, Bricker was so fed up, he decided to contact a congressional investigator to dig into why his complaints were being swept under the rug. Until this point, all of Bricker's concerns had been raised internally, following an archaic protocol laid out in Hanford's employee manual. The managers above Bricker, including those in charge of the DOE, didn't follow the same tack. In March 1986, Bricker left a message for DOE Hanford manager Mike Lawrence. According to Hanford guidelines, the message should have been confidential. But Lawrence immediately rang up Hanford's president to tell him about the pot of trouble their employee Bricker was stirring. That same month, Bricker and his team were put in charge of cleaning up a radioactive spill, a result of a piping mistake. While these sorts of accidents weren't novelty, this particular misrouting occurred along a road that Washington Governor Booth Gardner was planning to travel during a meet and greet trip out to the Hanford site. Bricker and his team had been instructed to remove all signage along about radioactive dangers and cut the ropes that blocked the roadway. It was a dangerous order, as any toxic dirt turned up by the Gardner, Gardner's or his escort's van could have spread radioactive material for miles. Bricker was stunned. He believed that allowing the road to be used was a substantial threat and told the congressional investigator as much. The incident would let, later make their news after an internal investigation deemed the removal of the signage an improper decision, resulting in the suspension of three managers. While the levels of contamination involved were low and the decision was made believing that safety would not be com compromised, it was a clear violation of procedures, 
said Paul Lorenzini, director of Rockwell at the time. In 1987, the Seattle Times reached out to Bricker for an interview. Later, ABC picked up the story as well. It was pretty apparent after I spoke out for the first time that I was never going to be forgiven for what I had done, for taking things out from under the Hanford cloak, recalled Bricker. Of course, his contractor Rockwell, and later the company's successor, Westinghouse, saw him as a use useless troublemaker. Management was not on his side, but Bricker stayed the course, believing he was slowly making a difference. If the public knew about the problems at Hanford, the DOE would have no choice but to fix them. Questions about Bricker's mental and psychological fitness began to flare up. He was sent to an array of psychologists in an effort to label him as unfit. In two separate meetings, Bricker was asked, how do you feel about your fellow workers, your employer? Do, and do certain things tick you off? They would ask questions like, how do you feel about your mother? Do you kick your dog? I was terribly embarrassed, Bick Bricker remembers. It was humiliating and degrading. The plot to get rid of him picked up speed after Bricker conducted an interview with the Seattle Times. Bricker told the reporter he was convinced his employer already knew he had talked to the press, even before any story had been published. Internal memos detailed exactly what transpired. In January 1987, Rockwell manager Clay Croft Crawford met with three others to discuss the future of Z, which they were trying to get back up and running after it had sat idle for three long months. Rockwell was set to lose its contract after the company was outbid in a war with Westinghouse, which meant Crawford was likely to be out of a job. They had six months to figure something out. Crawford hoped that restarting Z could extend Rockwell's work at Hanford beyond their deadline. Shortly after the meeting, memos reveal Crawford was approached by an, an assistant at the plant, John Fulton, who said a worker named William Cook had informed him who was passing along insider information to the press. Cook had been contacted by a Seattle Times re reporter about a Hanford story at the direction of Bricker, who believed he was passing along a valuable, like-minded source. Cook immediately pegged Bricker as the one who'd been leaking to the press the previous months. <coughs> Crawford, steaming, immediately assembled a group of colleagues to discuss the best way to oust Bricker. By now, they were all convinced that Bricker leaked internal documents and, without evidence, blamed him directly for Z's closure after various safety issues at the plant were made public. During Bricker's tumultuous deal ordeal, he reached out to Tom Carpenter, who worked for the Government Accountability Project. I would drive out to see him at his home and we and would notice a black man parked near his house. It was everywhere we went, remembers Carpenter. We were certain the damn thing was following us, which caused Ed to become pretty paranoid about the situation. Parker was intent on finding, Carpenter was intent on finding out who was behind the mysterious black band that was tailing them. So he filed a subpoena to get a list of all vehicles purchased by Rockwell. Couldn't believe what those records uncovered. A 1987 purchase order for an unmarked van. To this day, he keeps the document tacked to his desk as a sort of souvenir of his early years fighting for whistleblowers. It reads, 1987, Rockwell, Security Project Master Plan, Tactical Com Command Investigation Vans, purchased of unmarked van, which is equipped with surveillance equipment, emergency lighting, radio communications, and is completely self-contained. The criminal investigation group requires a mobile unit equipped to handle sensitive investigations and to conduct surveillance as necessary to support customer-directed activities. It was evident we weren't crazy, confirmed Carpenter. Later, the Department of Labor released a report investigating Bricker's complaints and divulging Rockwell's scheme to ruin his career. The report revealed that Rockwell was covertly targeting Bricker in a dirty counter-operation scheme called Special Item Mold. John Spear, the DOL's special investigator to the Bricker case, spent over a year gathering information eventually producing four binders worth of discovery. The operation to target Bricker was run by Whit Walker, a veteran Air Force counterintelligence operative under the direction of Hanford Chief of Security General Bill, Bill Brookshire. Walker and Brookshire had real power at Hanford. Walker was the chief of Hanford Security, a miniature private mercenary outfit with a police force of 300 officers who had access to machine guns, helicopters, and other counterintelligence equipment. Their mission was to defend Hanford from spies, criminals, and Russian terrorists, and anyone they deemed a threat to Hanford's secrecy. Rick Bricker, a mid-level whistleblower, 
was the biggest threat to business as usual at Hanford, a business Walker and Brookshire were paid big money to defend. In a testy, de in a testy de deposition, Tom Carpenter confronted a surprised Brookshire about the unmarked van that had stalked them and likely other Hanford troublemakers. Bookshire repeatedly denied they had a van, and that's when I showed him the purchase order with the signature on it, says Carpenter. <laughs> Brookshire was totally pissed, screaming at me. Where did you get that? And he stormed out of the room. By catching Brookshire, Carpenter exposed the length to which Rockwell was willing to go in order to silence those who spoke out about Hanford's dangerous working conditions. There was one golden nugget in John Spears' investigation. The mole in Rockwell's special item mole operation was likely Bricker's best friend, best friend Jack Manis. Maybe we can start some questions. Let's do it. <clears throat> so I'll just fast forward that little section that Jack Manis was asked to wear a wire to try to get dirt on his friend. And he didn't get any dirt on his friend because his friend was pretty infallible. Um, but that didn't mean that was where the powers that be stopped with Ricker. Um, as the story goes, and you can finish reading in the book, he was tasked one day with hiking into this very radioactive canyon. And as he got down there, he found out that his oxygen pack had been loosened. Uh, so he went for his backup and it was taped shut. Um, he believed it was an intentional act um, to kill him or to at least poison him with radioactivity. Uh, so did Tom Carpenter, who, who told me the story um, and confirmed it. Um, Ed raced out of the, the canyon as fast as he could, trying to hold his breath the whole way up. Um, to this day, Bricker is very, very sick. Uh, he has melanoma all over his body. He has lung, lung disease. He, he experiences chronic pain. Um, and um, I hope he sticks around for, for a lot longer, but uh, he's not well. And he believes that that is a result of his work at Hanford, in particular, this one incident that he believes was an attempted murder. Uh, there was no criminal investigation um, and no investigation at the time at all. Uh, about this event. Um, and I, I wish I could say that this is only one kind of instance where uh, silencing of whistleblower took place out at Hanford, uh, but that's not the case. Um, it's happened repeatedly, and, and I believe it will happen in the future if there isn't more transparency out there. Um, but, you know, uh, if I could, I would, I, would, I would shake Ed's hand and all those who uh, are raising, you know, blowing the whistle from the inside. because That's what it's going to take for the public to become more aware of what's actually going on out there. Um, so let's let's uh, let's open it up for discussion or questions or criticisms or or, or anything. Um, anybody just wants to raise their hand? Or, I got so, something to kind of add to your point, Josh. Yeah. I, I'll stand up because of the fact. I think I mentioned to you between 1980 and 1987, I worked for EPA Region 10. And I worked in the 100 and 300 area out of Hanford with EPA. And you, you talked about a little bit about how the Department of Energy, I don't want to call it a rogue entity, but it sort of does its own thing and controls. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things they did to me was I was maybe one of 10 people in EPA that the Department of Energy gave a Q clearance to. Okay. They have their own classification system. It's not secret, top secret. You know, it's, it's cute. So in order to do work out there, you had to have a clearance from them, even if you're EPA. To walk on that site, you had to have their permission and you had to have their clearance. Well, what that meant is that every technical report that I would come back to Region 10 and write had to go, could only be eyes only to someone who had a Q clearance. And there were only 10 people in EPA, maybe, maybe 12 who had Q clearances and could read the reports that were being generated. So even the regional administrator couldn't read the report. <laughs> it would have to go back to DC and someone back there could read it and do whatever. So in essence, for a good five years, everything that we did at Hanford from EPA's perspective went into safes that were separate from other records of the agency and were just held because it was uh, uh, Department of Energy classified. And in that way, they were able to isolate their operations 
quite effectively from EPA oversight. Now, I don't know how ecology got around that in this state. At some point, maybe that ended after the Cold War. They couldn't do that anymore. But for a good decade, that was a pretty effective way mm -hmm. of controlling information flow that might have made a difference. Yeah, definitely. So um, just a little antidote, really. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the big things that came out of the Ed Ricker case was that he did end up filing this uh, a lawsuit uh, under the Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, and in that lawsuit, there was 12,000 or so documents that were released. I don't know if any of those were in that pile, but that's when we first learned about some stuff that had gone on and intentional releases of radiation, the Green Run event, um, and other stuff out at Hanford over the course of its decade of operating um, leaks and other things. So it took a whistleblower in this case to get some documents like that out into the public eye. Um, and, it, and it continues to be that way, even though it shouldn't be, right? It should, it should be open, an open book. Um, so where is uh, Dan Newhouse? That's how Congressman from my area. Yeah. Where, what, does anyone know his position? I called him up. I got some stuff out of them. I went to their website. Because um, I think it's important that there's a lot of people in this room and, you know, politics works. And I'm not sure where Dan Newhouse stands, but I think that this is an important issue and maybe we should get someone, you know, with that backup candidate that is taking this forefront. Because I, I got a feeling, I don't know, I hope someone disagrees and gives me the, the rundown on it, but I wasn't sure that Dan Newhouse was just playing the Bechtel game and, you know, playing, you know, throwing the balls up in the air. So, um, uh, from a journalistic point of view, uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> that seems to be that case. Uh, he goes to bat for Bechtel. He's been a big advocate for more and more funding without, you know, accountability. Um, and he does get a lot of money from uh, lobbyists that right. support Bechtel. Bechtel is a private corporation. They're one of the most profitable private corporations in, in the U.S. Um, and they have a, a very powerful uh, lobbying apparatus in D.C. and Newhouse is a recipient of that. Um, but this is really um, not a party, you know, it, it's both sides of the aisle okay. that over the course of Hanford's existence have, you know, been on side of the corporations. Um, so, but in the case of Newhouse, definitely, he's definitely in the pocket that's of Bechtel. Where I grew up, that's also my library comes from the same town. Uh, there was a, a big mass shooting on a train one time, and this woman's husband was murdered, and her son was paralyzed, and she ended up running for Congress on that, on that platform, and she won. And it would be nice if we had somebody, you know, just gung ho, zealous, you know, maybe their husband or wife was killed at Stanford, um, Hanford, and, you know, really send a message to Congress, have some champion, and then maybe, you know, we can get a grassroots thing going because it's one of those things. I mean, I grew up on Long Island. We used to have drum and they used to do the plus plus thing all the time. Mm -hmm. They used to have orgies. And but they still sent us to the moon. They, they did the lab. They built the F-14 and F-16, right? Those fighter jets. So they get things done, but they waste so much money. And any time the government gets involved, you can probably attest it's a mess. But still, that's our biggest hope. I mean, he's our congressman. And uh, and what it sounds like, he's just you know, he's just a hack for this, just my opinion. So yeah. I just hope everybody remembers that at the polls. If there's somebody that comes up who's going to be, you know, Singing our song, we should be like, you know, not me. Thank you. That's a good point. So then we flew into New York to Costco about two weeks ago, and uh, waiting down in the baggage claim area, there's a constant uh, a TV with you know, flashing advertisements on it. And we saw one for uh, Floor, which is one of the big people out there, yeah. telling about how wonderful they are for the community. And another one with Bechtel, two for Bechtel, saying, you know, we are funding this uh, STEMS program and we're bringing all these. I mean, if, if people that I've seen and we've talked to, they're, they're totally sold. Sure. I mean, they're just playing their, their, their bread and butter for yeah. generations. Didn't they, even in this ad, they were bringing up this. To oh, the big plan. Yeah, yeah. I this think plan. it's happening. This yeah. Is, yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. I also have an anecdote. I, I worked up in uh, Moxie 
some summers ago building a uh, uh, coal storage plant, and I was working with an electrician, and uh, he was a local man, and I asked him if he could see if anyone he knew who had worked out of Manhattan. He said, yeah, the locals don't go there anymore. Mm-hmm. And, he, and the story he told me was that he had a, uh, he was supervising one of his uh, electricians dropped a wrench on his foot in the middle of the day, no big thing, but it really hurt. And at the end of the day, he was still hurting, so he took him to the ER and did an x-ray. From his waist down, his bones were pretty much dead. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, as an apprentice, he was out in Hanford digging trenches for electrical lines, you know, and he said, go along, you had to get a Geiger counter, you find a hot bush, and pick it up and throw it out of the way. Yeah. But he just, you know, just basically irradiated, irradiated and from the down. Yeah. I mean, I think those kind of stories are very, unfortunately, very common. Yeah. Um, and it's something I even learned, uh, so there's a series of different events that were part of this program. And I can't remember who said it, you might remember, Jimmy, um, but they were talking about, uh, they're used to, they used to go out with the Geiger counter and basically show you which bushes were radioactive and they'd spray them purple or something. Yeah, the Columbia River Keepers. We did a presentation yeah. with Columbia River Keepers and that's recorded. You can watch that on YouTube as well if you missed it. And we also have the current issue, which talked about airplane of efforts. So yeah. Yeah. And but they stopped doing it. They stopped doing it because it was scaring people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a lot more scary not to know, in my in my view. But yeah, thank you. Um, Another question on Bechtel. Um, reading the book was very interesting because it took me back to when I first started reading about um, Hanford, and that was in 58. And of course, I didn't remember that um, until I read your book. And I thought, oh, yeah, I remember reading about that. Mm-hmm. And at that time, there was a lot of question about how well things were going. Uh, I can't remember if that was before or after the switch to Bechtel from. Yeah. From the grids, mm-hmm. um, but nothing really came of it at that point in time. At least anything that we learned about. Um, more recently, over the last 20 years, there have been several uh, series of articles in Portland papers and mm-hmm. Seattle papers that have been very clear that that Bechtel has not been included on its promises. Right. Um, and I know you want to keep throwing money at somebody who has such a huge institutional memory, mm-hmm. but if all they remember is stuff that hasn't worked, uh, it's so hard for me to understand why they don't get a different uh, primary contract. Do I, know, I think it goes back to the problem of having you know so much power in Washington. I mean, Bechtel, I mean, the history of Bechtel, they follow basically all U.S. military ventures overseas. I mean, they have a, obviously, if you remember what in Iraq, they had contracts to build hospitals, <coughs> didn't do it, failed. They, they, you know, they, they were, they are the ones that built the big underground. Uh, uh, my wife might remember the name in Boston. The dig, oh, um, right. which I read about a little bit. Uh, also, you know, the, the government, government accountability office has come out with these reports saying how much Bechtel ripped us off, and calling for their removal and saying they're not fit to finish this project. And then a year later, they get a renewal. <laughs> so. You know, it's like they issue these reports. They, they, these reports come out from well-intentioned journalists like myself, and it just kind of falls on deaf ears when it comes to you know the powers that be, and it's unfortunate. Um, but I think it goes back to the kind of power that they wield, and that there aren't a lot of other options, right? I mean, in a perfect world, the Department of Energy be, would be the one actually doing the cleanup. I, in my view, they wouldn't be contracting this stuff out. Um, but the history of contracts in this country and, and the privatization of you know, all military, you know, development um, is, you know, been going on for since this, the Revolutionary War, right? So it's an extension of that, and it's even more corrupt than, than, than now. Um, Bechtel pours so much money uh, into, you know, it's all this dark money that funds campaigns, and Bechtel, uh, you know, has a lot of, of secret channels to get money and support candidates, and there's a reason why their contracts continue to get renewed. And I, I, I try, I try to cover that a little bit in this book. But you know, there, there's um, uh, Sally Denton wrote a fantastic book on Bechtel, and really, you know, her argument was how much uh, Bechtel controlled Washington when it comes to certain contracts. 
and, and how these contracts are structured. I mean, they came up with cost plus. So um, there's a historic legacy there that I think taints everything that happens today out of Hanford, unfortunately. Any ideas on how to turn that around? Well, we can get a new Supreme Court and get rid of it. <laughs> um, I think it starts with trying to demand accountability. I mean, I think it does start at the grassroots level. I think it starts with uh, trying to get our Congress people to, you know, ask them what their positions are on this. And, 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 and I think that we need to, on a very basic level, have demand congressional hearings. Um, we, have, we have hearings about everything, right? I mean, Facebook, Google, any, I mean, why, but we're not on Hanford, like not on this contract where billions and billions of dollars are being spent in a, a, an atomic catastrophe, you know, uh, in our future, if not, if, if sooner, you know, um, it's, it's mind boggling to me. But I think with that kind of demand, all you need is one congressperson to demand this, you know, uh, to say we want to hold hearings. And I think that's how it happens. You know, uh, when one whistleblower, Walter, Ta Walter Tamasitis, who I write about, um, he, you know, he went to Washington and spoke. And, you know, that, those kind of things happen, but I think it needs to be a bigger kind of investigation. Um, unfortunately, I don't think either party is really open to that right now. Um, the Trump administration, de you know, really tried to defund the Department of Energy. That's kind of continued under the Biden administration. So it's a systemic problem, um, and it's definitely not a party issue. But we, you need, you know, you need one, you need one uh, Hanford zealot in there that understands this stuff that wants to, you know, call attention to it. I think you could get some accountability that way, or at least hold these contractors a little bit more accountable. I mean, even just a little bit would be a big, big step forward. So going forward with the, these uh, storage tanks, yeah, in this area with seismic activity and things, is there anybody overseeing that, or how we? Oh yeah, I mean the, the tank farms are being managed, and I think right now the hot topic is, uh, which they're probably going to come out with in the next month, is are they going to abandon the vitrification process? Take this waste out and essentially turn it into grout or a type of concrete and then store it above ground. Um, and there's a lot of debate about this. And it's going to act, everybody's going to act like this is a big new thing, a big, great new innovation and idea. Well, they tried this in the 80s. And some of the old timers that have been around for a while um, will point to the fact that it didn't work in the 80s and it's not going to work today, um, most likely. <laughs> the Columbia Riverkeeper and other organizations are really opposed to this because they know that it's not really solving the problem, it's kind of moving the problem. And uh, it, which is kind of what they did. They, they pulled out uh, cesium and strontium, which are very radioactive materials from a couple of the tanks that were um, very risky. And they took that waste out, they put it in these gigantic tubes. And those tubes right now are floating in this kind of like Olympic sized pool to keep them cool. And the, I think that the pool is like, the same color as our cupcakes back there. <laughs> it's like radiating. And that is a very concern because that's a temporary solution, right? Um, it's not a forever solution. And that that facility is on a fault line. Um, if that if there's some kind of rumble out there, we can see a release of radiation. Um, if something goes wrong and the electricity goes out, right? Because you need power running consistently. So the dams might be still producing power, but if something goes out, if there's an attack, I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong um, that it's, you have to stop like, thinking about it because it's pretty, it'll keep you up at night. Um, but getting this stuff into grout isn't, isn't the solution. And I think um, there will be a lot of legal battles ahead. Um, and their way around it is to declassify this stuff so they can turn it into grout. So the tanks, yes, that's definitely being monitored. Um, but we've had so many accidents in the past, you know, and, and, and when things are past their lifespan, there's only so much you can do, you know, you can watch it. Um, I write about one instance that they poured so much waste in one of these tanks. They, they had been asking for more tanks, um, financing for more tanks, but they weren't getting it. They said, no, no, you have enough tanks. Just keep with what you've got. And this is the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission. And well, lo and behold, they had too much waste in one of their tanks above the threshold. It starts bubbling. It starts like literally around the tank. There was an earthquake happening. They had to sit back and just watch it, and hope that there wasn't a huge eruption. 
And luckily the tank held and they got back to business. Um, but they were so close to so many disasters out there that, um, yeah, it's one of the reasons my mom doesn't like this book. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that um, the alternative to storing it above ground is storing it deep underground, mm -hmm. and that Yucca Mountain has qualified to be a, a well um, a repository. Site yeah. To, to be that. Can you talk about that? What you think about that? Well, there is a lot of pushback. There, there is some some debate about that being a, a safe forever site. Um, that that there is some seismic activity there, and more importantly, that site is a sacred site to some indigenous nations, um, and so they've had a lot of pushback. Similarly, Hanford is uh, has many sacred sites, um, so you know you run into these problems. Um, and I wouldn't say a secret site is a problem per se, but it's a problem for those that want to bury stuff in the ground. Um, but there's so many other problems around that. Well, let's say we, we do have a Yucca Mountain type situation where we have this huge uh, repository um, for where we can bury waste. Well, you have to get the waste there, right? So you have to truck it there or you have to put it on rail, which is what they've done to get stuff to Hanford in the years past. And I don't know, if you watch the news, but transporting high level waste on rail is very dangerous. Um, you could have a chemical mishap, right? Like we saw in Ohio, um, or in the case of atomic waste, even far worse, right? So there's so many problems, um, which gets into the conversation about waste in general and what to do with it. We don't have any permanent waste disposal site in anywhere in the world right now for any of nuclear waste, whether it's atomic production, or I mean, for, for weapons or for power. Um, so that's a big concern. Um, and then even if you find this repository, who can say that it's gonna be safe for the lifespan of the stuff it's holding? I mean, when you have iodine-119, which lasts millions of years, plutonium hundreds of thousands of years, and in the, in the case of plutonium, it can be used in weapons. You know, once even, whatever process it goes through, whether to make, you know, plutonium for a bomb or plutonium that's a byproduct of the fission process in an atomic plant for power, that's already one step closer to being used in a bomb. Um, so proliferation is a really big issue, no matter what kind of plant it is. And you know, right now, and it's getting a little bit off topic, but not really, um, along the Columbia River, they are planning to, you know, in the early stages of building what they're called small modular reactors. And uh, there's a great documentary, which I'm sure hopefully it will show out here, called Atomic Bamboozle, uh, that a filmmaker in Portland um, and I, uh, made, that really goes into the problems with this. And one of those problems is that is the waste. And in the case of those plants, they want to take that waste and potentially put it out where the Trojan facility was, where the Trojan <laughs> above ground uh, casks are. Well, that's a temporary solution. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know anything about the geology of this area, but it's not gonna, you know, we're gonna experience either a massive flood or earthquake way before that stuff's not radioactive anymore. So yeah, it's a huge, huge problem. Um, and I don't know, you know, once they turn this stuff into glass, it will be in the safest form that it possibly can be in. It'll be the least radioactive form if they can do it. Um, but and going back to the money being spent, I don't think anybody would disagree that billions and billions of dollars needs to be spent on this stuff um, if, it, if it, the job's getting done. I think the problem is it's getting spent and the job's not getting done. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we just, you know, justify that? Uh, you know, how do we spend that money without, without the job getting done? Nitrification won't reduce the amount of radioactivity and it's, it still doesn't, I don't know, does it never break down glass? It must. Well, it's, if it's in the glass form, from my understanding, and I'm not a scientist, it will be um, in a encapsulation that is the safest it can be. Um, so, you know, right now the stuff that's in a tank, a storage tank that constant, you know, that is bad. The, uh, the grout issue, they don't think it's stable enough. They think that it'll break down over time. So the glass seems to be the best option if they can do it. You know, they have still haven't found a they way. They still haven't done it. <coughs> or found a way. 
for sure that they can do it. Or well, they have done vitrification at the Savannah plant or Savannah site um, where they also produce plutonium. You know, vitrification has a track record. The problem with the Hanford vitrification is that each one of these tanks has a different makeup of material, so it's very complicated to try to get it to, you know, um, for, for each, each tank needs its own kind of system. Yeah, I've kind of the issue with vitrification. It's a twofold issue. The first is the amount of energy that it takes to do it. And if you're thinking about vitrifying an area about the size of this room, mm -hmm. the 12 feet down, you're talking megs of electrical energy. Yep. Huge amounts of electrical energy, number one. And that has a, has a intended cost, right? Yeah. And the infrastructure to get it to where you're going to vitrify. And the other problem, the problem that hasn't really been solved, um, is the issue of volatilization. When you're doing this and you're volatilizing, you know, silts and sands, plus hazardous materials, um, basically everything that is volatile, including steam, that's generated from groundwater or um, phreatic aquifer, is going to come up. Yeah. Right? So you've got to catch all of that. And you've got to contain it. And not only do you have to contain it, but you have to uh, put it, which means you have to have multi-stage uh, stripping columns, carbon absorption, um, virus precipitators, and they all have to be online, they all have to be functioning, and they all have to go to 100%. Otherwise, you're creating a public health nightmare where you're doing this. So it's not a panacea, yeah. it's not cheap, nope. and it has some significant attendant risks that have not been resolved. Yeah, yeah. Which is a problem with uh, nuclear waste in general, right? <laughs> a lot of problems haven't been solved. Yeah. When they do that hydrogen, um, when it releases, is that radioactive hydrogen? Um, no, it's just hydrogen. I mean, there's other fumes in there, though, that could be radioactive. Yeah, okay, so uh, but hydrogen itself is just... So when they release that, it's just clean the hydrogen. Uh, yeah, hypothetically. Okay. That explosive. Potentially, yeah. I mean, hydrogen builds up and, it, and a spark ignites it. Yeah. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. catastrophe. Yes, uh, in the book, you mentioned uh, that one of the... One of the problems with the whole nuclear uh, energy is the declining amount of uranium available. Yeah. Uranium ore. So it sounds as though uh, they're kind of uh, it's 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 a uh, you're pouring a lot of money after something that has a very finite life. Uh, I mean, sooner or later. But you know, I think in the book you said they're going to run out of ore by 2070 or something to that effect. Unless they offer, you know open massive new mines. Yeah. Um, but that takes a long time to get up and running. You know, I mean, they really, in my view, there's this new push in these small modular reactors that they're talking about building along the Columbia are being built as an answer to climate change, right? That here we're going to have a carbon-free energy source. It's renewable. It's endless. Um, but there's so much <laughs> that can go wrong. Um, it's also very expensive. And more to the point of what you're saying, it won't happen in time. Um, these, these things aren't going to get up and running fast enough to impact our, our reduction in carbon emissions. Um, and so that's another big issue. So yeah, uranium is, is one of those issues. I mean, that proves, I think, that uh, atomic energy really isn't renewable, right? You, you, or you're relying on a finite resource. And uranium mining also has just a a horrible legacy in this country that has largely impacted the Navajo, the Diné, um, and it's been the same all over the world. And so, you know, going after more uranium also means really horrific impacts for, for local communities as well. Well, the other thing on it is that this, this claim of carbon, uh, zero carbon, is total nonsense because the amount of energy required to mine it, yep. refine it, transport it, to dispose of it. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. And then, then what do you do? Like, well, with Trojan, I mean, you know, it's, it's decommissioned. Everything on it is too hot to touch. Mm -hmm. It will be hot, too hot to touch for generation to generations. Yeah. How do you dispose? That costs a lot of money. Yeah. They cut that into pieces and barged it up to Hanford, right? Right. That's right. Well, not to mention, as we're learning in Ukraine, Zaporizhia has now proven that these facilities can be used as tools of war. Yeah. So even if all the propaganda that I would call propaganda by the, the pro-nuclear industry were right, that it's carbon-free, that it's, you know, all of these things, no one can tell you that these things are safe in a war zone. And no one can tell you where war is going to break out 100 years from now. So that alone should give us pause, I think. 
Um, do you have any bright spots? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, you know, I think I do. I, um, that's a good question. And you and my mom would get along very well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think it's really important to talk about the victories and to learn from those victories. And one of those victories uh, was a big one out of Hanford was Russell Jim. Um, Russell Jim was a member of the Yakima Nation and really was a pioneer um, in so many ways, uh, not only in being able to articulate what Hanford was, but also to talk about the history of his people in the land and what the Treaty of 1855 that was signed between the Yakima and the government, what it meant for the Yakima and the future of the site. And he understood the scientific complexities, he understood the bureaucracy, and in the, uh, early, the 80s, when Yucca Mountain and Hanford were two sites that were being chosen for a repository for a high level waste, he said, we've had enough. Like, there's enough waste out here, we don't need to put more out here. Went out to DC and really wasn't even listened to. You know, there, there's obviously uh, systemic racism that exists today toward Native Americans. Um, I would say there was much even more so back then and especially at the government level. And he went out there and really broke down doors and barriers and uh, stopped Hanford from being a, a, a repository. And also um, now there is no decision that can be made out of Hanford without the Yakima and the Confederate tribes having a seat at the table. And that's largely because of him and, and all those that he worked with. Um, and that, that to me is kind of one of those hopeful kind of stories that we need pioneers, we need people like that. We need movements led by people like that. And there doesn't always have to be a leader, but we need movements. And, and Russell Jim, you know, that legacy, the Columbia Riverkeeper, the Yakima Nation, there are organizations right now, Hanford Challenge up in Seattle, that are doing really, really important, great work that really deserve all of our support. Um, because they know this stuff, you know, they're, they have a seat at the table right now, and um, they will represent your voices if, if you're able to, you know, share those with them and your concerns. So that, the story of Russell Jim, I think, um, it really lends to what needs to happen in the future, and, and, I, and I think his story is just a remarkable one, and he was a remarkable man. And I was fortunate to, have, you know, interview him a couple times. And found out that my brother-in-law even used to spend holidays at his house, <laughs> which was pretty cool. Uh, I'm Josh's father-in-law, probably. And I, this is my third presentation that I've been to work in Oregon. And I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we have some things in Oregon that they don't have in Washington. Like we have a, a law that was passed by uh, initiative that says that no nuclear plants can be built in Oregon without the approval of the citizens of Oregon until they solve the waste problem. And the waste issue is the bottom line in my mind after hearing all this stuff. And these new smaller plants that they're talking about putting in have the same waste. And the thing is young people don't know about this. And they are they're all excited. There's these millennials or some scientists that are all excited pushing this stuff. And you look at the age group here, and this has been the same in Portland as the ones I've gone to, and we know because we all live through it. In, in Oregon, you know, they got the, uh, the plant shut down. So we have to try to also get young people to know what's going on, and we have to stop the nuclear uh, business in its tracks because they're just going to keep going and they're just going to create more problems. And Hanford is the the glowing uh, example of, <laughs> yeah. of what's going on. Yeah, it is. It really is the stake in the ground for, for the industry. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting the myopia, the myopic view. Of it. Like you, you, I watch sometimes you know, these videos of nuclear physics people, physicists, and you know, they, a lot of nuclear, nuclear physicists say, hey, nuclear energy is a really good, you know, this woman yeah. is German, and you know, with the German. German accent, you know, those are the great nuclear, you know, the great physicists. Oh, it's a great thing. It's on balance. It's ba I'm like, do you know what it's like to have this in your backyard? It's like, how can you make this? And yet, France, 
oh my gosh, like I don't know how much percent of there is all radio, you know, nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of scary. And then, you know, they had a they had a parade in our little town and they had the Democrats and I said, Oh, how are you doing? Hey, did you read this? There's a book I want you to read, Tom of Days, go to the library and get it. And they're like, Oh, that's a great thing. I'm so glad you're doing all that. That's fantastic. You want to come on, but they're not interested in like jumping. They want you to jump on their bandwagon, but like who's jumping on this bandwagon saying, no, it's this is the issue we should be attending to because that one, it's not if, when, is that going to come into the river and all these wind surfers and all this, they're going to be blowing, you know? I mean, it's kind of scary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and yet there isn't that sort of emergency kind of like global warming until now we're starting to say, oh, now we have to make everything electric vehicles. I don't know if that's a solution, but it's like human nature. We wait to the, like, too late. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I talk, you know, a lot of the best criticisms, I think, are coming from the scientists as well, right? That okay. not all physicists support this. You know, the Uni Union for Concerned Scientists, there's a lot of organizations that understand the perils. Uh, Arnie Gunderson, people that were, used to work in the industry, um, are the best critics, yeah. uh, in, in fact. But I don't think that means that they're the only ones that can be critics. You know, there's there's so many reasons, and you know, they. Also, I, I do try to have a little bit of sympathy for those that might, and this goes to kind of what you were saying, Dave, about people that support the industry and young people in this Millennium for Nuclear movement, which is very well funded um, and flashy, and it's, it's it, you know they have a they have a draw, but I think it's because people are deeply concerned about the climate, and I think that it is easy if someone presents an easy answer to you. Um, so we do have to combat that and say, no, there is no real easy answer to climate change. This isn't an easy answer. In fact, we're going to be creating so many more problems. So is that, how is that a fix, right? And, and how do we, passing these problems to future generations? I mean, are we a, a, a concerned about the climate because we're concerned about its impact on future generations? Well, we should just be just as concerned about, you know, what we're leaving behind with this radioactive waste. And Hanford and the legacy of Hanford. Um, any more? One more? <laughs> okay. Um, just to, just to, in the last few weeks after reading your book, I, I guess I was going online just for searching for more information. And I was really surprised to learn that uh, the, the current Miss America is a nuclear engineer and she is just going out there <laughs> pushing this, you know, idea. And she was at Hanford. A few weeks ago, it, I saw an article suddenly. Miss America, the nuclear engineer, is this wow. at Hanford, you know? So you got people like that out there. Yeah. But I was like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. I wanted to, I was looking to try to see where I could send her a message and say, have you read? <laughs> <laughs> like, and I couldn't see any way, you know, to get through to it. But it was just, I was like, oh my god, that's another one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And she might be a. Uh, she probably has some sponsors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Just begins with B. Right. Are you on a, a book tour and, and speaking to people? Because, uh, you know, out here, if, if that Columbia River goes, the economy, like you said, and so I do think it needs to be brought to everybody's attention that relies on the Columbia River for agriculture and moving things and fishing and recreation. So I just don't know. Are you going? I'm doing the most I can. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can. Yeah, I mean, thank, thanks to the library, and you know, because they got this book into like hundreds of people's hands, which has sparked, you know, probably thousands of conversations about around kitchen tables and other, and that that's where this kind of thing starts. And I'm obviously not the only one concerned in talking about this either. Uh, pick up a copy of the Columbia Riverkeepers latest uh, magazine. Um, there's a lot of people that are well, you know, way more informed than me in many ways, and that are, are are fighting the fight day in and day out. And I think those are the people that we need to support. And I just hope that this can be just a, a small little tool um, to help get the conversation started. So well, thank you, thank you so much, everybody. For coming.